in the scopes what we have seen is defining the formulas first and then sub formulas of a formula. So, we noted that if there is a formula you can think of a sub formula. If you start with an abbreviated formula then you might be wrongly concluding something to be a sub formula which need not be a sub formula because to start with you should start with a formula itself not any string right. Then you take a sub string of it which itself is a formula then you say it is a sub formula of the original right. So, you have to start with a formula that is a cousin. If you start with an abbreviated formula there can be confusion which will conclude wrongly as a sub formula it may not be really a sub formula right because of the precedence rules. Then we try to define the scope of a quantifier right. So, it is simple we just say that scope of an occurrence of a quantifier it is not a quantifier it is the occurrence because in the same formula there can be several occurrences of for each x right. So, which one you are considering you have to mention it. So, we say that scope of an occurrence of a quantifier not of a quantifier ok. So, suppose it is for each x then you say the scope of that occurrence for each x is the sub formula starting with that for each x. So, starting with when we are going to the right reading to the right not like Urdu or Arabic ok. So, this is the convention we are taking throughout. So, you take a formula then look at an occurrence of a quantifier then find the sub formula starting from that occurrence whatever is the sub formula. So, that sub formula will be come from the original not from the abbreviated you become trend then you find out ok in the abbreviated also this is the scope is that right. So, then once you find the scope you say that every occurrence of that variable which is used by the quantifier there that occurrence of the quantifier becomes bound right. Suppose you write for each x if x is a man then x is mortal then both the occurrences of x in if x is a man then x is a mortal. So, both those occurrences become also bound by the same occurrence of the quantifier for each x. We also say that the occurrence of x along with that quantifier is a bound occurrence by default right because it is also inside the scope is it clear. So, let us write it we say scope of an occurrence of a quantifier is the sub formula. So, always we have a formula in the context that we are not mentioning here always we have a given formula in that context you are only writing because scope of that occurrence means occurring where formula is required there right. So, quantifier is the sub formula. So, when you write sub formula again is sub formula of the given formula right is sub formula starting with that occurrence. Okay. For example, if you take for each x suppose you take this formula, then the scope of this there is x should be equal to the whole of this up to this that is its scope and the scope of this for each x look at the precedence had there been bracket it will be the whole of this. Since, there is no bracket by precedence rule for each x only goes along with this right. So, for each x will be this much only ok. Similarly, scope of this there is y will be again whole of this. is it ok. Then next we say that 
an occurrence of a variable is a bound occurrence provided it is within the scope of some quantifier or some occurrence of a quantifier. Right? So, an occurrence of a variable is bound if it is within the scope of some occurrence of a quantifier. So, for example, here this occurrence of y is a bound occurrence, this occurrence of x is a bound occurrence, because it is within the scope. Okay. Now, what about this x? This is also a bound occurrence, because it is within the scope of this. What about this z? Is it bound or not bound? We will say it is not bound, because our thing is we have to say it is a bound occurrence, if it is occurrence of a quantifier there is something to add which uses the variable, right? because here there is no quantifier which quantifies over z, we should not take it as a bound occurrence, no quantifier binds it. Right? So, you have to write occurrence of a quantifier that uses it. Okay? So, you say that an occurrence of a variable is free if it is not bound. Fine. So, let us say of a variable is a free occurrence if it is not bound. So, any occurrence of any variable will be either bound or free because of this. Okay. Now, there is one more thing we should see when this binding of the variables occur by the quantifiers. Now, here is one x. So, this is a bound occurrence because it is within the scope of this. I may also say that this is a bound occurrence because it is within the scope of this. Also, it is a bound occurrence because it is within the scope of this for each x. Right? So, which occurrence binds it? The nearest, right? so the innermost or if there are many occurrences of variables along with the quantifiers okay? and there is an occurrence of a variable somewhere else. So, that occurrence will be called to be bound by the one which is the rightmost among all these. Right? So, if a variable occurs within the scopes of many occurrences of quantifiers that use the same variable, then it is said to be bound by the one which is the rightmost among these, right? that is the rightmost among all these. For each x, there is x, for each x, within all those scope this occurrence of x lies, but it is bound by only one this which is the rightmost among these. Is it clear? Okay. We might need also not only occurrence, but the variable itself whether that is free or bound. So, you say that a variable in a formula is bound if it has at least one bound occurrence and again a variable is free in the formula if it has at least one free occurrence. Right? So, that means, a variable can be both free and bound, though an occurrence cannot be both free and bound, it has to be either, but a variable can be, because that has many occurrences, depending on the occurrences it will become, we may need this concept both the ways. So, this it is customary to tell that way, instead of telling if it is not bound it is free or it is not free it is bound, we say that a variable is bound if it has at least one bound occurrence 
and it is free if it has at least one free occurrence. Then there can be formulas having all the four possibilities, right? And a variable is neither free nor bound. A variable is free, not bound. Variable is bound, not free. A variable is both bound and free. But can a variable be not bound and not free? Huh? It's neither bound nor free. Is it possible? In a formula, you want see in a formula when you say variable, it has to occur first, right? So suppose it has occurred, then either it has occurred within the scope of some quantifier, it is bound by some quantifier, or it is not. <coughs> so take any occurrence, it is either free or bound. So if it occurs, that occurrence, take any occurrence, it will be either bound or free. So one of these should occur, right? One of these cases should be happening that case is not possible. Is it clear? Now then we define a sentence to be one which is having no free variables. Right? A sentence is a formula having no free variables. A sentence is also called a closed formula and all the other formulas are called open formulas. So, when you translate from English sentences, you will get really sentences, closed formulas only, not open formulas. But we have to really give meaning to both, open and closed. We might have cases where open formulas will occur, even if they do not come from natural language. So, will give meaning for both of them. So, that means in a closed formula, you take any occurrence of any variable that has to be a bound occurrence, right? It cannot be a free occurrence, there is no free occurrence at all of any variable, then only you say it is a sentence, <coughs> fine. Now, let us go back to our Aristotelian sentences to see how they become closed formulas. Say all men are mortal. Suppose I write h of x as x is a man and m x means x is mortal. Then what is translation of this to f l? For each x, if x is a man, then x is mortal. Okay. Now, some man is mortal. There exists x, x is a man, and x is mortal. Now, no man is mortal. For each x, if x is a man, then x is immortal. That we want to write. It is not the case that you will find a man who is mortal, right? That is what it is telling. It is not the case that you will find one man who is mortal. Okay. Some man is not mortal. Yeah. Or there is one man who is immortal. Or you say it is not the case that. Either of this. And you see that this is also the same thing as telling all men are not mortal. Hmm. 
not all men are mortal will be what it is not that all men are mortal okay so what will be that it is not that all men are mortal same thing as this also they are same both these are same we have seen it is ambiguous but that is its meaning in natural language is it not all all children in this class are not brilliant what do you say it doesn't refer to you right you are not children <laughs> okay then what do you say yes are brilliant it is not the case that all children here are brilliant so that means there exists at least one who is not brilliant is that okay so they give the same meaning sometimes any also confuses with not any is also like an ambiguous quantifier it sometimes means all sometimes means some especially when with not it gives the meaning of some so you have to be observant about that what is the meaning of the sentence so see all these aristotelian sentences are only having monadic predicates unary predicates so aristotelian logic is simply a sub logic of our first order logic where you get only monadic predicates nothing more and there is no equality predicate used so it is called pure monadic logic so it was a long leap from coming from to aristotelian logic to first order logic it took almost 2000 years to reach this first order logic what we are discussing now this was the end of all logic at that time that's why we have to mention it specially but then he had a very difficult way of uh, tackling all these arguments with these kinds of sentences all these sentences were of these four kinds that was his first observation now we know that it concerns only monadic logic binary predicates cannot be handled here right so those examples also we'll see how they will come up nicely but then with this he had to really struggle to give which are valid arguments which are not then right? because in his syllogism there will be really three sentences two will be premise one will be conclusion like your classic one all men are mortal socrates is a man therefore socrates is mortal fine so in that syllogism what happens is the first sentence socrates is a man can be written now in fl so socrates is a constant so let's write some a or s now what happens you say it is a man so s is a man it will be simply hs so now we'll have two premises there hs and then you have the other premise as for each x it's x implies mx and your conclusion is ms okay but in these two sentences you will see that there is a common term the common term is h this predicate men right socrates is a man all men are mortal man is the common term there and in the conclusion you see that that man is gone that is eliminated so that connection is exploited it is eliminated then you conclude something about the other two terms so that was his scheme of syllogism always there will be a middle term you exploit that middle term and then conclude connecting the other two minor and major terms right so he gave how many possibilities are there he found there are four possibilities for the sentences so socrates is a man is of first category that is also universal like sun rises so he says it is universal sentence so of these four types you will see that the arguments will be brought up using these four types of sentences each argument will have again three sentences two premises one conclusion and there is a middle term in both the premises where the middle term rests for example here if i take socrates is a man all men are mortal right so man comes diagonally right 
so one first term middle term next middle term next last term okay so that gives rise to a figure where the middle term resides so you will get four figures in this sense so this is your middle term again this is your middle term so there are four figures and each one will have a conclusion so there is something else here in each figure there will be three places to be filled in and all these can be filled in by four types of sentences right each one of this is an argument is a syllogism okay so how many syllogisms can be constructed that was his first point right let us see there are four figures take one figure in one figure you have four possibilities here four types of sentences another four here and one four here so four into four into four right into four so there are 256 types of syllogisms right so he solves all this and says that there are only 19 out of this which are correct all the others are wrong syllogisms so one some argument is there you just identify which syllogism it falls this one you remembered all those 19 okay this is valid if is not out of those 19 it's invalid so that was his way of dealing with it now we have a better way of course we don't have to remember those things but he also devised a nice way to remember them huh? for example this one okay this is one a sentence this is also another a sentence and the conclusion is also one a sentence so he gave a name to this as barbara barbara so there are three h will be coming in that sequence and some consonants are inside so that you remember a name right so similarly there is another where first sentence is e another is a next is e e sentence is the no one no man is mortal there are called the e sentences so then you say silarent e a e huh? a is for all men are mortal e is for no man is mortal i and o right i is for some man is mortal o is for no man uh, some man is not mortal right so then he devises say e a e so he gives a name silarent so barbara silarent dari ferio cesare camestres festino baraco you remember all those nine names huh? and then find out this syllogism is this it is valid the other one is invalid forget it that's how the procedure went okay but now we are tackling something more along with the monadic logic pure monadic logic we have equality symbol we have some other things even binary predicates and so on so we cannot remember like this we have to devise some better way of giving meaning and then working out it okay so what we suggest is first try to find out what is going on when you give meaning to these things right for example we know what are the bound variables what are the free variables what are sentences once we know it suppose i take one of the sentences say uh, for each x hx implies mx one of the sentences now how do i give meaning where will i find meaning to this that's the first thing right even to make it simpler let us say hs so h is a predicate it's a unary predicate i know s is some element it's a particular constant so constants can be given meaning as some element in a set let us say like in human beings we give meaning as socrates h as is a man so this is translated as socrates is a man fine but it need not be socrates is a man when you look at hs because h can be anything s can be anything so it will come something like something is some type is of this type right it has the capability of being interpreted that way it's not necessary like go back to socrates is a man right it might be something this chalk is white right 
some sort of thing or this mineral water is infected right any anything of that type can be taken there is that right now the thing is where to look for such meaning so what we see here is you take first concentrate on the set of human beings there you find one particular human being then associated that with s right a constant will be associated with an element of your domain so you have to start with a non empty domain if you take empty domain almost everything will be vacuously true there all for all x so, it will have nothing for us. So, we have to start with a non empty domain, and the domain we do not know how big is it is, which domain it is, right. So, you have to really transcend it. If you say something is valid, it should be true in every domain, right. For example, you say p x or not p x, p x implies p x, for each x, p x implies p x, it should be valid in every domain. If x is p, then x is p, right. So, some such things we have to really filter out later the valid statements or valid sentences or even valid formulas without the uh, constant of every variable being bound right every occurrence being bound. So, to consider this let us start with a simple one for each x h x implies m x. Now, suppose I want to interpret in the set of natural numbers, right. So, how do I interpret? How do I check whether this is true or not in natural numbers? My domain is natural numbers now, not human beings. Yeah. So, what I have to do is I am thinking of h as something, some predicate, right. Say h x means x is a natural number, m x means x is a real number. Now, I cannot say x is a real number when my domain is only natural numbers, real number has no meaning there, right. So, I have to give something else, say I say h x means x is a prime number, okay. m x means x is even, right. So, I have to verify now whether every prime number is even or not, that I have to verify, it may be true or false, does not matter. Okay. Is that clear? That is how I will be going. So, abstractly what I do, I will verify whether h 0 implies m 0 is true, my first question. Right. Next, I will ask whether h 1 implies m 1 is true. Right. I will continue that. I must verify for all the natural numbers that is what the sentence demands is that okay? for each natural number h of that natural number implies m of that natural number it should be true whatever this h and m may be I will consider that later let us say fine, but there are some hurdles like 0 for example is not our constant. So, h 0 is not a formula right our constants are not natural numbers, what is the constant in a first order language or in first order logic itself. There are f 0s, so we have agreed to write them as a b c and so on, but not 0 1 2 3 4, they are very particular objects, they have, they have some structure in that right, but our constants have no structures, they are just syntactic entities a b c d and so on, they can be substituted or x can be some terms here also that is in general that is possible, but certainly I cannot say h 0, h 0 is not syntactically allowed in first order logic. Uh, is the hurdle clear? This is the hurdle we are facing now. Uh, see 0 is not a constant in first order logic. In first order logic we have the constants as f 0, f 1 and so on right? with superscript 0 these are the constants f 0 0, f 0 1, f 0 2 these are our constants. So, when I substitute here you are thinking you are substituting a constant, but they are not constants. Okay. But we have to do something, so that means I may think of these constants as my 0, this constant as my 1 and so on. So, I have to interpret certain way, I have to read these constants as those zeros in my domain 
have to associate this interacting entities with my concrete things, natural number which I am taking now. Right? So, one association is required, agreed, we will associate that way later. Now, even if we associate, now instead of 0, I am thinking of this as F 0 0. Okay? What about this H? Let us say A, A is allowed as F 0 0, we have put some convention. So, it will come to H A implies M A, similarly H B to M B and so on. I may think of this now, right? And I have to think what this H is. Again, I have to associate. Like these constants were associated with the natural numbers here. Similarly, I have to associate these predicates H and M with some concrete properties of natural numbers. Something is prime, something is even, something is odd, or some some such thing, which talks about natural numbers. It's a relation of a natural numbers, right? That I have to associate. We'll associate. Fine, but then what here we are doing is we are forgetting this for each x and considering the open formula h x implies m x. Then in place of x, I am substituting the constants and trying to verify the truth of those new sentences, right. So, some substitution has taken place, this x have been substituted by the constants now, right. In general, you can substitute variables by terms. Why only constants? Any terms can come. Like you may say, it is uh, h of successor of zero implies m of successor of zero. So successor of is a function, right? So it is f of zero. That is instead of x, you can write f of zero, f of a. That is also allowed. Therefore, terms are also allowed. If constants are allowed, term must also be allowed. In general, any term can be there. But what about our terms? Our terms not only involve constants, they involve also variables, right? Is that okay? Say f of a is allowed, f of x is also allowed. So it should be true for x even, f of x even. So I can write h of f of x implies m of f of x, whatever x you choose. That will be a subcase of this. Once f is a definite function, it will be a subset of this, right? So, it should allow for all the terms, substitution should be done for all the terms, right. Is that clear? That is what we are now addressing, how to substitute variables in terms, whether everything is allowed or some constraint is there, that is our first concern. Let us take one more example, say for each x, there is y h x implies f x y. I am taking a binary predicate here intentionally. Okay. I want there is y also here. We can interpret or this might have come by translating the sentence if x is a human being then x has a father. Right? Every human being has a father. Okay. F x y means y is father of x let us translate that way, right. So, now our first concern is if I go to all human beings, I have to verify without this for each x, right. I have a formula there is y h x implies f x y. Here what I am going to verify in place of x, I will substitute each human being, right. Find whatever number may be infinite number of sentences and determine whether truth all those sentences are true or not. That is what it demands, fine. And now I see that this x can be replaced by any term also, not only constant human means any term also I can replace. Okay. So, that term may be something like elder brother of x, right? that is also allowed. So, I may see there is y h x implies or h of f of x implies f let me write g rather f g of x y. Now, how do I read this sentence? Say x has been assigned to some particular person Socrates, right. 
Now, what happens? This says if Socrates elder brother is a human being, okay, g of x is g of Socrates. So, elder brother of Socrates is a human being, then that elder brother of Socrates has a father. Okay. So, that means elder brother of Socrates has a father, this is the sentence. So, this is allowed, there is no problem. Okay. Now, instead of this g x, suppose I write there is y h g of y implies f g of x g of y y. Any term is allowed. So, instead of g of x, I substitute g of y in place of x in the original this sentence. Right. So, how do you read this? There is a person now y is quantified, right. So, there is a person, it is not really a person, anything, there is an object whose elder brother is a person, right. G of y, if that happens, if elder person of elder brother of somebody is a person, then what happens? He is his own father that elder brother is his own father, that elder brother is his own father, this is absurd, right. See the problem with substitution, huh? why this is happening, let us see the reason why this is happening. This case it did not give any problem, it says Socrates elder brother is has father that is all, but this says there is one person whose elder brother is a person, then that elder brother is his own father. Right? Yes, x can be substituted by any term. So, I substitute g of x, now I substitute g of y. Well, what it amounts to is that here x and y are different variables. So, even if you write g of x, this x is a free variable, but now when you write g of y, this y is getting captured by the quantifier, it becomes a bound occurrence, right. We do not want such capturing to happen. If this happens, then there will be problem. Earlier it was free, now it is not free, that is what we see, right. So, a substitution should, should not make a free variable bound, it is becoming like that, but there is no free variable here. So, it is difficult to express this idea, right. We cannot say free variable becomes bound, because the free variable was x, x is not here, how can you say, but that occurrence whatever you have written that becomes bound, right. So, after the substitution a variable is becoming bound, that is happening, it is variable capturing. So, variable is getting captured by the substitution itself that should not happen, right. So, we have to introduce some more ideas before even we go for the semantics, how to give meanings. See, we have to be very patient here because we are tackling a very big logic, it is almost it is uh, capable of expressing almost everything. Huh? So, we have to be very careful and be patiently going through. So, suppose a formula is again in a context, in that context only we are talking, a formula is given. Then in that we have some variables, okay. we say x and y are variables occurring there, we say even does not occur, we can see what is the vacuousness here. So, let us take two variables x and y, we say x is free for y in a formula y say z if now you want to see that if it is free then substitutions will be allowed if it is not free for y then x cannot be replaced by y that's what we want to express okay if x is free for y then you can substitute x 
for y, replace x that by some y, right. So, what happens? See here it is creating problem because x is occurring within the scope of there is y, that should not happen, right. So, that we have to write if x does not occur within the scope of there is y or for each y in j. So, x is free for y if x does not occur within the scope of a quantifier that uses y, right? then it is free. So, x becomes free for y, x can be replaced by y. Fine. Then you have to go for terms also, not only variables. So, you say that x is free for t, t is a term here, free for t in formula z, if x is free for y for each variable y that occurs in t. So, this is very essential now. Then our aim is to go for the substitutions. So, we will give a notation for the substitutions also. X is a formula, small x is a variable and t is a term. Then we will write x, x by t for the formula which is obtained from capital X by replacing each occurrence of small x by t, right. That is what we want to do, fine, do not write now. That is what we want to do, but there is again one more hurdle, we have to see that. Suppose you write p x for each x. Now, here if I write x by t, okay. suppose in this formula I substitute x by t, then I will get for each t p t which is not a formula. Right? Because t is not allowed in for all, only variables are allowed with for all. Fine? But if I take p x, there is no problem it is syntactically allowed right so which means only free occurrences can be substituted bound occurrences need not be substituted we don't need them they are already bound they are not there right is it clear any bound occurrence you see as if it is not there you will see later that it can be replaced by any other name it's a named gap so any gap can be introduced there doesn't matter okay so, what we need here is that x x by t is the formula obtained from x by replacing each free occurrence of x by t in x. Okay. And whenever we use substitution, we assume that x is free for t. Okay. We always assume that this x is free for t. That is our assumption. Sometimes it is told that an a substitution is called admissible if x is free for t. So, in our terminology all substitutions will be admissible, we will accept them, otherwise we will not use the substitution at all, fine. Okay. Maybe we will stop it here. So, all that we have done is introduce the bound and free occurrences and then when and which substitutions are admissible, fine. Then later we have to use these substitutions to give meaning to the sentences or formulas in first order logic.